Hello, in this lecture we're going to talk about the section 179 deduction, talk about what it is and how could it help my business. At the end of this we will be able to define section 179 deduction. We want to be able to explain what depreciation is and discuss how book depreciation differs from tax depreciation and why. First I want to point out that we do want to seek advice from a professional when we're talking about the tax code and depreciation as well as bookkeeping and accounting in general. So what is a section 179 deduction? It's basically going to be an accelerated depreciation in which you're going to get full year, uh, full depreciation in year one. The first year of purchase is the idea of the section 179 deduction. Now, in order to understand that more fully, we first need to know what is depreciation, what are fixed assets, why does it, uh, what's the difference between basically having it all in year one. So first, what is depreciation? When we buy something like uh, a building or something like a forklift, we're going to have to put that on the books as an asset rather than expensing it when it is purchased. Even if we paid cash for it, we generally have to put it on the books as an asset and then expense it. I'll explain kind of why that is in a second, so bear with me on that. Um, that Then we're going to take that equipment and see what the useful life is. It could be like between 1 and 40 years for bookkeeping purposes, and we're going to have to then expense that equipment over that time period as it's being used, that's going to be the concept. So an example of that would be that we would have, say we spent $10,000 on that forklift. If we said it had a five year useful life, then if we used a straight line method, we would have depreciation or an expense and that would be a deduction for taxes. So that's good for taxes. And that would be 2000 a year, right? Year one, 2000, year two, 2000, year three, 2000, year four, 2000, year five, 2000, adding up to the 10,000 total. Now you might be saying, well, why is it that if we paid 10,000 cash up front, especially if we are on a cash basis, that we do not get to deduct 10,000 as an expense when we purchased it because we paid cash for it. And even under a cash basis, and the tax code's really not under a cash basis for things like large purchases like equipment. So cash basis usually applies to like inventory, but when we purchase large things, then we're still basically on an accrual basis. And the idea of that, the reasoning of that from an accounting standpoint is that if you spent 10000 for a forklift, you haven't consumed the asset. You didn't use up the 10000 You used it up to buy a forklift. A forklift's another asset. So you traded one asset worth $10,000 for another asset, a forklift worth 10000 Nothing has been consumed. It hasn't been used up. It's a form of investment. So we invested it in the asset. And from an accounting standpoint, we want to expense that as we use it. That's the conceptual framework of why we would have to buy something large, put it on as an asset. You, could, you can hear it called capitalizing it as an asset, but investing it as an asset. So it's going to be an investment in the equipment. Then we have to expense it as that asset is going to be used. That's going to be the basic idea of depreciation related to fixed assets, things like equipment and buildings. So what's the difference between tax depreciation and book depreciation then? Well, book depreciation has the goal of most accurate financial statements. So this idea of putting something on as an asset and then expensing it over its useful life, it's, the goal is to make the financial statements as correct as possible so that people can make good decisions based on them. And that's the ideal of book depreciation. When we think about the tax code, however, there's going to be different kind of goals. We don't really know exactly what the goal is because obviously it's a law and law is going to be made by a bunch of different people who have different objectives. But obviously the revenue is, I mean, the IRS wants to collect money. So that's going to be one goal of the tax code. There's going to be a lot of other things. There could be like welfare programs within the tax code. There's ideas to stimulate the economy in the tax code, meaning we try to create jobs and put more money out there in the economy in order to get to stimulate job growth and job creation and small business creation. That's probably the major focus if you were to ask a lawmaker why you put in a 179 deduction, it's probably this kind of Keynesian idea of we need to uh, incentivize people to do more business. If we have a 179 deduction, people will invest more in equipment and that will have a, a multiplier effect and whatnot on the economy. That's probably the main uh, answer that you'd get from an economist or someone who, is, who would say, why do we have a 179 deduction? Uh, tax depreciation is very specific and has a specific useful life. So this is going to differ from like the book depreciation. On a book depreciation, we can kind of say what's going to be the useful life that we think is going to be the useful life of this forklift. And we have a bit more leeway in terms of, you know, five years, 10 years, three years. 
in, in determining what we think is best. The tax code is much more specific. You got to go to the tax code and say, okay, this is this type of asset. Look up that type of asset in the tax code, and it'll tell you how many years is going to be its useful life, how many years to depreciate it over, and it's very specific on that. Uh, very specific on depreciation method permitted. So again, on the bookkeeping side, if we were thinking about the, the bookkeeping, we could use straight line, we could use double declining, we can use units of production, uh, we can use different types of methods to depreciate in order to, once again, make the books as accurate as possible, that being generally the goal on the bookkeeping side. You can use similar things on the tax code, but it's going to be a lot specific. So like the straight line method, you can usually elect a straight line method, but there's still going to be differences oftentimes uh, because the, the tax code will often have a mid-year convention, meaning anytime you purchase something, a lot of times it'll be considered to be have purchased in the middle of the year, which may not be the way the, the book are handled and you could have something similar to double declining balance but generally again not exactly the same for a lot of depreciable type of assets for that reason the book depreciation is often going to differ from the tax depreciation so you basically have to have two sets of books when it comes to depreciable assets if you're running the business in terms of gap accounting generally accepted accounting principles for bookkeeping and the tax code for taxes because these differences will almost definitely have a difference in the depreciation methods that will be used under the two uh, the two methods. Now, it is possible if we're a small business to say, hey, you know what, I just want to line up to the tax code and not have this separate depreciation based on books, based on best practice, based on generally accepted accounting principles. If you're not required to have an audit uh, and uh, you're a small business and you're not looking for a loan or anything that would need you know something that would have to be under accrual basis for the financial statements, then it's possible to just say, hey, I'm just going to use the tax code. Now, the tax code's not going to be as accurate because we're going to talk about a 179 deduction and, and you know some other special deductions and whatnot, which are not geared towards the best decision making. It's not geared to have your financial statements look as correct as possible to make the best decisions on them. Like we said before, it's going to be geared on all these other things, one of them being to stimulate the economy. But it may be enough information for a small business to to make decisions on and the added information of having two sets of books may not be worth the cost in some cases. So you gotta do kind of a cost benefit analysis in that. So how does section 179 deduction fit into this picture then? Well, the 179 deduction basically kind of allows the asset to be more on a cash basis, meaning that if you purchase something in, the year, in that year, uh, you can deduct it all in year one up to a certain amount, up to some conditions here. So in our example of the forklift, if we pay 10000 for the forklift, it's possible that we could deduct the entire 10000 in year one. That would be the idea of the, one, the section 179 deduction. Why would the tax code allow that? Basically, the argument is probably being to stimulate the economy, to try to get people to purchase more stuff. That means more money's out there. More businesses are, are able to purchase and whatnot, and that has a multiplier effect. Okay, so what's, what's the catch? What are these conditions you speak of? So we're going to have some conditions. Uh, it's it's going to be a dollar limitation, so whatever year you're in, you're going to want to just check what the dollar limitation, 500000 in 2016 was, is the limitation, and the equipment must be placed in service uh, in same tax year. So you can't really just buy a bunch of stuff at the end of the year that you don't plan on putting in, in service yet. It's got to be something that you're actually using within the tax year uh, in order to qualify for that year. Uh, you also want to check what types of equipments are, are going to be qualified. So a lot of computer equipment and most most types of equipment will qualify for the 179 deduction. Other than that, it's, it's pretty wide open for uh, a lot of, you know, things qualify. A lot of equipment qualifies to take this 179 deduction. So can I use Section 179 deduction for a new car? That's often going to be a an, an question for a lot of businesses. Vehicles becomes uh, kind of an issue a lot of times. Now, if it's a, if, of course, if it's a big work truck that's clearly work related, uh, you're much more likely to be able to take the 179 deduction. If you're talking about a uh, four door car, especially if it's a luxury car, then there's often going to be some limitations. So you have to check the year and see what the limitations are. So usually around like 11,000. So the 179 deduction is going to be a lot less effective, of course, in that case, uh, because they're going to limit, they're going to cap the autos and of course autos is something the IRS kind of looks at a lot because you know it's perceived that there could be abuse on the on the types of autos and the deductions being taken 
in terms of is it a personal auto, is it a business auto, and whatnot in that area. Where can I get more information on the depreciation of, one, of Section 179? Obviously, we got the IRS.gov website can go to and look up a lot of information on that. And then I would consult the tax professional, of course.